Hey guys, um, I'm just going to dork around for a minute and let more people show up. Mark, can you need to cut yourself? Hey Chuck. Alright, sorry I'm finishing this muffin. Ugh, I'm sorry man. Okay. <laughs> you channeling your Bob Ross there. Happy little cuts. Okay. I'm just waiting until uh, more people show up, but I'll start pretty soon here. So this is, um, hey everyone, again this is part of the Virtual Apprenticeship Challenge. I'm making myself available to them to ask questions. If you're not part of the challenge and want to ask questions, that's fine too. If you're not part of the challenge and you'd like to take part in the upcoming one, let me know. It's 50 bucks. It's a month long course. Happens with a cohort of other people. And we cover all of the important topics to get your spoon carving up and running. Um, and uh, today's topic is going to be finishing cuts. And it's just occurring to me probably have to do a separate video for burnishing. Um, all right, just dropping my knife here while I wait for the channel to populate. And then I'm going to start talking about finishing cuts that I'm going to be doing on these three different spoons. So today is meant to be some show, uh, some question, <laughs> I almost said show and tell, some question and answer from you guys if anyone has questions, but I'm also going to be talking a lot about finishing cuts, and for me that also means all of the using the hook knife. Um, so if your questions are on that, so much the better. Any questions so far? I'm sitting here in the back kitchen, so my wife can be studying in the front kitchen. She thought it was sunnier, but quite frankly it's pretty sunny. Alright, so I spent an hour and I roughed out these three spoons. I have a cooking spoon, a camping spoon, and what was going to be an eater, but there turned out to be a crack in the back, which I might not have eliminated all the way. Let's see. So it turned into a kid's spoon. Uh, what I want you to notice about all three... Oh, she's in nursing school, Mark. Um, what I want you to notice about all three is that I've kept nice square edges to the side. So everything is in four planes at this point with obviously some curvature to the back. But the handle in particular, I have made sure that the handle lines up nicely. Right? Any twist that I've had, I've taken out. Usually I take out the twist by lowering the lip on the appropriate side to undo the twist. But you'll see how nice and even everything is. Now, the shape is going to be within that. So depending on how much I want to take off chamfers, I need to make sure I leave this fairly fat. But even so, I want to keep it nice and square. If you do the, the tempting thing, which is to start knocking off corners, you're going to very quickly lose your sense of where's the center of gravity within the, the spoon handle. And you'll end up with a wonky handle where one... Uh, one line will be much deeper than the others without you quite realizing it until the end. So you'll notice that on all of these, I've maintained nice straight sides, as though I'd taken them to a bandsaw. In fact, if you have a bandsaw, you might as well just take it to a bandsaw. Um, I think, like anything, you'd learn a lot from, from doing that, and certainly that's exactly what this is. The idea is that it's just going in a, at a complete right angle to this top reference face. 
all the way around and notice that I've maintained it all the way around and what that does is it lets me adjust the curvature here and here and it lets me adjust the handle here and here without changing the way it looks from this dimension. Um, so I get everything nice and cleaned up to this point and you can see my process on those videos that I did last week. Um, but basically there's a point just before this where I take a pencil and I re-sketch in the shape exactly how I want it and then I re-carve here, carve everything one more time, get to this point and you'll notice that I haven't done the bowl at all. Um, and I haven't even carved flat across the bowl. Instead I've done these very shallow chamfers to reach the bowl. Um, and the reason for that is actually beautifully illustrated by this. So this was originally going to be an eater, which has a bowl about the size of this. Um, but there was a crack on the back, which actually might still be there. So I needed to reduce the size of the bowl dramatically and, and make it a, a kid spoon, which is next up in the list anyway, so it worked out great. Um, had I already carved the bowl, that crack, I sound like lurch out of it. Yeah, I'm getting over sun. Um, had I already carved the bowl, that crack would have been it for it, for the spoon. It would have been over. But because I had left this intact, I was able to shift everything away from that side that needed to get smaller and, um, and still salvage a spoon from the situation. So for me, it always makes sense to carve the bowl at the end. And I even do it after I've chamfered the handles and all that because sometimes I have the, uh, sometimes something goes wrong when I'm chamfering the handles and I lose the spoon and I don't want to invest, have invested any time in the bowl and spoon unless I know it's going to work out well. Um, so at this stage, I am ready to, uh, I am ready to carve chamfers on the handles. Now each of these handles is going to be slightly different, although you'll see me basically approach them in the same way, which is to knock off a corner and then knock off the sides of each of that plane that then gets created. Because what I found for me is that it, it feels the best in the hand because you still have facets but it's very easy to adjust something because the facets aren't fussy. And so having lots of parallel facets that create a rounded surface that is relatively organic, relatively geometrical, somewhere in between the two, gives me the chance to most quickly achieve something that feels deliberate. Um, and you'll notice that I'm going to be good about sticking with the other two in a plastic bag while I do this. Any questions before I begin? Okay, so <clears throat> I almost always start on the back, and again, I'm not really sure why. And you'll notice that I achieve the long cuts in part by doing this thing where I continue in the same cut, right? Who am I taking for that cold? Why plastic to keep it green? Yeah, Mark, if I don't wrap it in plastic, then just the surface of the wood will dry out over the course of 15 minutes or so, and it just makes it that much less predictable to carve and, and tougher to carve later on. Um, uh, what am I taking for that cold? Uh, lots of throat coat tea and, um, and soup and water and all that jazz. Let's see here. Uh, unfortunately, it's not a cold. It was I was feverish the last couple of days, so it's the the aftermath of that. Um, all right, so there we have it. You can see that in however long that took me, I now have an, a beautifully rounded bottom to the spoon, um, and now I'll do the same. For the top, I'll knock off the corner, and I'll knock it off fairly large because then when I take off the two side corners, that's going to shrink the width of that facet. So how much to take off obviously has to do with sort of the shape you're looking for and how much material you leave. So it's something you'll have to develop for yourself, but um, 
you know, the act of taking off these then secondary facets does shrink the size of the original facet. So you have to take that into consideration. Um, and notice that I'm making these basically in one long cut. Um, but also notice that I'm not being super fussy about them. I find that as long as I'm fussy about getting to the squared off place that I was before, do I drop before starting? How often do I drop or do I just drop after sharpening? Uh, <laughs> no, I'm not actually out in the cold, Cheryl. Um, no, I'm in, I'm in the back kitchen. Um, uh, so, which is actually right next to the wood stove, which is nice. So Chuck, I happened to strop just before starting this, um, but it, that's sort of unusual. I tend to strop whenever the knife feels like it's not um, particularly working well, particularly when I'm using the tip right here in the, I don't know how to show this, right here in the neck where I'm doing this bit here. If, it, if the tip of the knife can't get clean in the neck here, then um, um, if the tip of the knife can't get this bit clean, then for me that's a sign that I need to at least strop, possibly sharpen. So I've been trying to push myself to strop a little more frequently, but I, it's not in my nature to do so readily, so um, I probably strop way less than you do. Um, is the truth. So now to get this uh, little detail here, you can see how one side is sharp and one side is rounded. I already did the thing that rounds the other side, um, which is just take one of these little facets and push it down just a little bit. But I'm going to do it on the other side, and that allows me to create this beautifully rounded detail here at the neck. Um, um, yeah, thanks for the offer about the laryngologist. I think I'm okay. Uh, okay, so now, voila, I now have my um, facets on the neck and I will also do uh, what I call micro chamfers. And I'll be doing these again. I guess maybe I'll do them, um, I'll just go from spoon to spoon to spoon. Uh, so micro chamfers, notice that I'm, I'm way choked up on the knife and in fact I placed my thumb here to steady it and then I'm using just the tip and, and there's something about placing my thumb there. If I was, if I didn't have my thumb there that I would tend to push in a little bit too hard but by keeping my thumb right here it allows me to have just the right amount of pressure because getting a good micro chamfer is about not digging in too much. So notice again, my thumb is right there on the edge of that blade and I'm just letting it slide down just the tiniest little bit. And I don't take a micro chamfer off of each of the facets, but what I find is that the the ones on the side, well anything that's particularly sharp and the ones on the side, it's just as nice if you, if you take them down, at least for my aesthetic. Um, and I'm not holding the blade like a, a, a scraper or anything. Um, so, just like that. And I think the key is putting your hand on the side like this. You always end up digging in too much or not enough, so it gets wavy, exactly. I think, Chuck, if you, first of all, see how choked up I am on this knife and then I think placing your hand on you know halfway up the blade like this will be uh, will be really good <laughs> hey Paul how you doing um, okay so that's facets on that handle I will also do um, just the the end now I used to do all sorts of different things for the pommels of my um, of my spoons. One thing that you'll notice is that I took the time, sorry I just kicked the tripod, um, I took the time to be really good about rounding this nicely before I started doing this little bit because again similar to getting a nice square sides on your handle the more you can set up everything to be 
even in one plane, it means that you can then round it in this plane and have it still look even in this plane. Train bulls today, so watch this video a bit. Yeah, of course. Um, have fun turning. So notice how I'm doing things with just the tip of my knife, right? I think people have a tendency to think that you get more power or something down here, but I do so much work with the tip. Because the thing with the tip is that you can see, when you, when you work back here, you can't see the effect of what you're doing, right? You can see the knife as it digs in, but you're, you're, the blade is completely obscuring what it is that you've actually done. Whereas if you use the tip of the knife, I can see exactly what I've done right here behind the blade. So by using the tip of my knife for all these finishing cuts, I get a really clear vision right away of whether I'm doing what I think I'm doing and I can adjust what I'm doing accordingly. Um, how do I keep spoons clean? Do, Paul, do you mean uh, like while I'm carving them or after I've carved them? What's, what's your, what's your problem? Um, you wash your hands before you carve, but you always find spoons get dirty, but you're carving birch too. Yeah. Um, are you stropping mid carve? Cause that'll get, that'll get your spoons dirty. That's one of the reasons I don't strop very often. Um, is I find when I do strop, no matter how careful I am to keep my strops clean and my knives clean and to wash my hands afterwards, Every time you have to sharpen or strop or anything while you're carving, it um, it shows up in your spoons, no matter what species they are. Um, so I try and keep it to a minimum, and I try not to mix sharpening or stropping with carving for that reason. Okay, so that's, that's one spoon done. Um, also, I'm not putting too much pressure, right? Well, so... I'm not putting too much pressure and notice that I'm, I'm moving it by moving this hand. Not so much, I'm not using this at all. I, the, the thumb is just basically holding that knife still and then it, all the force is coming from moving this hand here. Um, uh, yeah, it could be the oils from your hand. I mean, is, is, the, is the birch you're carving pretty fresh? I don't know. Excuse me. Okay, so I'm going to do, I guess I'm going to do these in waves so that we can really talk about each of these processes. Um, let's see. So, all right, well, first of all, there's still a little crack here, right there. Can you see it? Um, and I am going to... See if I can eliminate that, because if I can't eliminate it, then this particular spoon is not going to be kept. Yeah, I think that's fatal. Yeah. You can see how this crack, I don't know if I'll be able to sh show it to you guys. Come on, little phone. So there's a crack right there, and it goes in. And it goes in too deep. So it's a trash can right there. Into the trash can it goes. All right. So, so that's a great example, actually, um, both of why I carve the bowl last so that you can adapt. But then also, if there's a problem like there was in that spoon, I always try and run right at the problem and see if I can eliminate it and make it go away because I want to know before I invest any other material, any other time in a spoon if I can, um, if I can make it right. So that, that spoon would never have gotten that far if that crack hadn't showed up after I'd done the axing and all that stuff. It was only while I was rough carving it that it appeared that there was that minute crack in the spoon. Um, so typically if I see something that might be that might go wrong in a spoon, I dive right on it and try to see if I can make it go away because I want to know before I sink any other time into the spoon if I can resolve it or not. Okay, so I'm just getting this side a little more cleaned up because I realized that I hadn't. 
Um, okay. And then. Okay. So now, same deal, except I'm going for a, a shallower uh, thing. You're sad for that spoon. Don't be sad for that spoon. Um, that spoon was a piece of work. So again, notice that I've got my thumb braced in the middle here. Um, so even though I'm not doing a micro chamfer, I'm doing a very controlled cut. Notice how even that is and how I've been able to go all the way down the entire length of this spoon. And having your thumb right in the middle and using the very tip seems to be how I do it. And then I'll stop here and I'll continue the last little bit. And you can look down that. And it's not perfect, but it's pretty darn steady. So that technique is how I get nice, steady, even chamfers. Now, again, I'm not shooting for perfect chamfers. I'm just shooting for relatively even. And notice how... how um, how slow that was and also how controlled because coming down towards yourself is a much more controlled way of doing a chamfer than is going away from yourself because when you come towards yourself you're getting increasingly more and more control as your hand and, and elbow comes in towards yourself. Oh, I'm glad. So as your hand and your elbow comes in towards yourself you're getting more and more and more and more and more and more control. Whereas if you were to do it going away from yourself, as you get further and further away from yourself, you have less and less control. So you want to put yourself in a position of having more and more control rather than less and less. Um, and then by the time you get to this last little bit where you just sort of pull out away from yourself, there's so little left that as long as you want it to go in a straight line, you can basically get it, you know, nice and even and straight. Okay, so uh, okay. Mm -hmm. now depending on how far you tip the blade this way so that it's uh, almost in line with the handle, right? So right now I'm I'm what I'm doing is I did this and now I'm knocking off the extra edge. If I tip it too far this way, then it's almost as though I'm running, I'm trying to cut up the handle, which depending on how the grain flow is in your handle, it's not going to work. You're going to be going uphill. So you need to make sure that you're, you're tipped, but not too far. And if it starts to feel like it's um, tearing the grain instead of cutting it, you got to stop and come at it from the other direction because this little chamfer can sometimes want to be cut the other direction because it's so close to being uh, essentially cutting down the side. When you go away, it makes a curve in the middle of the handle. Yeah, and that's because and that's because you are increasing your pressure and then you go, oh gosh, it's too much, and then you decrease your pressure. Um, so yeah, coming towards yourself is definitely the way to go to have nice, consistent, even facets. And even if, like me, you're not shooting for perfect facets, this can still be helpful um, if you're just searching for sort of uh, a loose configuration of facets. Which, honestly, I feel like, for me, feels best in my hand anyways, so I'm always quite happy to do that. Okay, so again, there we are. You can see this little bump on this side. So that is actually just because I didn't finish it all the way to the end. So that can be resolved just by pushing that facet all the way to the end. And now all of a sudden it has the same roundedness that the other one did. Um, okay. I'm just noticing that my um, my bowl has a little too much material here. So before I go much further, I'm just going to take a moment and sort of draw what I think needs to happen. 
to it. And I'm having a hard time seeing it when I look at it from this direction. So I'm going to hold it like this because for whatever reason I can, I can see it better in this direction. But I'm having a hard time drawing it. <laughs> All right. Let me draw it in this direction and then take a look. Yeah, that's better. Even that tiny little... I'm having a hard time getting... Um, let's see here. There we go. Even that tiny little uh, bit will make a difference in, in how symmetrical the spoon feels. Um, so... Was that Sean? Hey, Sean. Uh, so I'm just going to re-trim this to that line before I go further. Because again, before I run chamfers, I want to have everything be as symmetrical as possible so that I have a better sense of how exactly the chamfers change the look. And... Um, and that everything is as even as I can possibly get it. All right, now let's run chamfers down the top. Now when you run chamfers down the top, you have to take into account how far up you went on the back and leave yourself enough material. <coughs> because if you completely eliminate this little stretch between here and here, you're going to change the way it looks when you look at it from this, this dimension. So you have to make sure that there remains that little bit there. And it's easy to forget to see that when you are starting to make these chamfer cuts and dig in just a little bit too deep. When I come down the top, I like to leave them attached if I can, first of all, because it's beautiful. But second of all, because it helps me come around here and, and trim them off later. So I, what I tend to do is I tend to do like that, right? And then I will come in. Wow, this glare is killing me. All right. So then what I do is I come in and I sneak in here with just the tip of the knife. And that's the grain change right there, right? Because the way I orient my spoons, they don't have a grain change in the rim of the bowl. The grain change happens at the neck. So that right there was navigating the grain change right here is where it happens. Um, do I mean this? Do I mean the side of the spoon? Which part, Mark? Um, so now that I've done the main chamfer, this glare is tough, man. Sorry, guys. I wish I had like a better. <clears throat> is that better? That's, that seems like it's better, actually. So now I'll do my secondary chamfers. And again, I will leave them attached if they want to stay attached. See, the reason you didn't see this on the back is because on the back, everything flows away from this part. So here on the on the front, you're going to have to address the fact that there's this grain change and that your facets are approaching that grain change zone. So this is the part where if your knife doesn't want to cut uphill the way mine is doing here, just slightly and for a very brief distance, that's a sign that your knife is not sharp enough. Um, I don't have a curtain up. Sorry, man. Um, it is overcast though, so that I think that's helping. Um, all right. Um, so if you if you
So if your knife is not able to navigate here and here, that's a sign that you need to stop and sharpen. All right, what spoon ended up winning the other day? Saw the tally, I didn't have time to look at it in detail. Um, so the spoon that won for me was, I believe it was number seven, which is the one that had the round bowl and then a tapering handle that was quite thin when you looked at it from this side, similar to a pocket spoon, how a pocket spoon is quite thin when you look at it from this dimension. Um, yeah, silly, there's a, there's a whole post about what I chose and why. You should check it out. <clears throat> and there's actually a related podcast episode that I did uh, yesterday about it. For anyone here who doesn't know, I have a daily podcast. It's called Emmett Audio. You can find it anywhere you get your podcasts. And it's usually three to six minutes of me talking about something usually having to do with business um, and the business of being self-employed and doing doing working for yourself. Okay, so now <clears throat> I need some water is what I need right now. So now I'm going to do the handle end again, and then I'm going to move on to doing the bowls. So does anyone have any questions about facets on the handles before I move on to bowls? And again, using the tip of the knife, I find really helpful here because I can see right behind the tip of the knife exactly what I did. And that helps me adjust what I'm doing in the moment. Whereas if you use back here, the knife hides what you've done and you can't adjust in the same way. So I do a lot of work with just the tip of the knife, which means that when you sharpen your knives, you have to be very um, fastidious about making sure that the tip is really well sharpened, which is tricky. So I'm worried about you. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Chuck. Um, <clears throat> well, what I'm trying to do is not cough, in part because it's unprofessional, but in part because it hurts. All right, good. Moving on. So, to do the chamfers on the opposite sides, you switch hands. Whoa. Uh, hey, yeah, you bet. Um, okay, so let's talk about hook knives for a second. <clears throat> There's two types of hook knives in this world. There are those that have tram rails and those that do not have tram rails. Um, those that do not have tram rails get sharpened on the outside, which raises a burr on the inside, which you then use a dowel or, or a ceramic rod to remove the burr, but you do not sharpen them on the inside. You sharpen the outside bevel. Those that have tram rails, you sharpen on the inside, and that raises a burr on the outside edge, which you then remove by stropping. So, uh, there are also different ways that people hold hook knives. Your classic, short hook knife. I think a lot of people tend to hold like this. I tend to choke up way more on it for two reasons. Number one is I get a lot more power. And number two is um, I find it safer because when the hook knife is totally closed in my hand, it still can't reach my thumb. Whereas if I'm back here, see how it gets me closer to my thumb. So the more it just has the effect of the, the more choked up I am, the further away from my thumb I am. Now, hook knives like this that have a longer handle, you can also hold back like this <clears throat> and then use these fingers to support the cut. I find this super annoying and frustrating. I don't know why people do it. Um, I still choke right up on this blade and that gives me lots of power. So that's what you're gonna see me doing. All right, so when I start, I almost always start here and I go sort of across the grain in a series of cuts 
like this, going across and across at an angle. The angle is crucial. I will, yes. Um, I'm not sure I can demo it from a lefty stance, Sully, because this is magically making me look like a righty. Um, and so you're going to have to see... I'm not sure. We'll have to figure out a different way for you to see it as a lefty. Um, or you could imagine it in your mind's eye. So remember, this is the deepest part of the crank right here. This is where the grain change is. And so all of the cuts essentially need to be made in this direction from here up and from here down. So the reason I'm going at an angle is that that kind of gets me, it allows me to make these cuts that are coming in here like this, even though I'm essentially going uphill a little bit. You can see I'm coming in from the side and I'll leave them attached just so you can really see them. Sorry, now this drives people crazy. Okay, so in from the side here, good. So, you see how that was done? So I came in here and worked my way down. Now, you'll notice that I did not try to, uh, to pop them out. I might have popped them out just fine. Either way, there's going to be this whole chunk here on the side that um, won't have been affected by this cut. So now, again, that looks like that. So now what I do is I turn it around, I brace it against myself. And now, remember, all of this wants to be cut in this direction. In this direction. Um, I should use a pen for this because that will show it better. <clears throat> Stand by. So all of this wants to be cut in this direction because that's the way the grain is flowing as, as it angles down to the log this way. So you just finished your first spoon and was about to sand some of the rough edges away. What process do I use after you're done shaping and before you apply your finisher oil? We'll get to that in a little bit. I, I burnish, um, which uh, if you go back through my Instagram feed, um, you can see a process of me burnishing. Um, and I will put up a video either today or um, sometime in the next couple of days about how I burnish things. Um, okay, so now notice that I'm going to do this next cut in a series of cuts like this. That essentially is running with the grain. And then as I come down... In order to see, I come down and all of a sudden I'm, I'm in the grain that needs to be cut in the opposite direction, right? Because remember, hey, thank you. Um, you know, these cuts need to go in this direction. Well, these cuts need to go in this direction because of the way that the spoon is oriented within the log, right? The log was like, uh, what can I use as a flat surface? Stand by. The log was like this, right? So you can see that. Cuts in the front of the bowl are diving down into the grain until about there. Cuts from the back of the bowl are diving down into the grain this way. So they need to go this way. Cuts in the front of the bowl need to go this way. So uh, these cuts that I'm doing down the side of the bowl here, like this, they're not going to be able to exit. Now I could do two things. I could leave them there and then come around from a different angle and remove them this way. or I could come down and then I could twist the whole thing and exit going across the grain because the hook knife is always willing to go <coughs> across, across the grain. So sometimes what that means is that I can go down and then where I would get stuck if I instead come across the grain, I can resolve that situation. So let's back up to the big picture again. Notice that as I carve the bowl of the spoon, it's too 
washed out. Let's see, let's see, let's see. Hold on, stand by. I get it better. No. Ooh, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. <laughs> With this steel fridge behind me. All right. How's that? That seems pretty good, actually. Okay, so. Notice that as I start my cuts, I'm staying away from the edge. And that's because there's a lot of material to remove here in the middle. And I don't want to have, I don't want to get anywhere close to that edge until I get some depth to my bowl. Because otherwise, um, I could end up removing material by accident. Um, so. Let's see, is that, is that better or worse? I know, it's, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. All right, uh, trash can, lovely. Okay, so. So, once I do those, my opening cuts are always the same. Here, I'll do them on this side. <laughs> this is where it's kind of fun having two spoons. So, notice that I'm pinching it between here, and I'm always supporting the spoon in the center of my hand. Notice I'm choked up on my hook knife so that as I come close to my thumb, I, d I never actually hit my thumb because I just can't, right? I'm totally choked up. I can't get any closer and I'm still that far away from my thumb. So, thumb is on the side and I do, I always do the same opening cuts from the, from the neck down to the tip of the bowl and I usually do the center to the sort of the center side. Now I flip it around, I brace it against my chest and I pin it with my finger. Same deal, I put my thumb on the opposite side and I do cuts that go down down the side of the bowl here that are going to address this side here, but I'm still staying away from that edge. I finish those cuts by swirling across. It's hard to do this in slow motion. By swirling across like that. And the swirl, the swirl is partly doing this with my hand and partly doing this with the other hand. So this is still kind of green. I can feel some moisture in it. Um, but like all of my wood that's green, it's been lying in the log for a while, so it's not gonna move nearly as much and it doesn't have nearly the moisture content uh, that it would if it was truly green. So sometimes you're making cuts and there's no way to swirl, right? There's no practical way to swirl this cut out because there's, there's, there's just no practical way to do it. So you leave it attached and you come in from the other direction and can clean it right up by coming right across it. So at this stage where I have the initial shape started, some depth achieved and still a nice wide rim, what I do now is I go around and around and around and I want to go down and out at roughly the same time and achieve my, my depth that I'm looking for around the same time that I achieve the rim thickness that I'm looking for. Now some of these cuts, like that cut that I just did here for instance, this cut where I have my thumbs crossed, this thumb is bracing on the back shoulder, and this thumb is essentially locking this thumb down, and then I'm, it's an open and closed cut here. That is tremendous power in that cut. I can get a ton of leverage with this cut. And I can go all the way across the, the spoon bowl like that. I can't see what I'm doing down here very well but there's a lot of power to be had in this cut and it's very safe. You know anyone else here in Instagram who does that swirl cut? You don't think I've seen anybody else's kind of technique. 
<clears throat> oh, don't worry, you'll get to see that move a few more times. Um, I don't know of anyone else who, who does it that I've seen them articulate, but I, you know, I haven't seen a ton of other people's carving techniques, to be honest. Um, so, so here's another great example of the swirl cut in action. Getting this back shoulder here. So again, all the if you don't brace with your thumb, if you're just holding it like this and you're trying to do a swirl cut without bracing your thumb, you don't have any power and you don't have any control. This thumb is acting as your pivot. So I'm just holding the spoon loosely. This thumb on the opposite side of where I start acts as my pivot and 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 I'm essentially pushing with this thumb and pulling back towards it with my hand. So I'm pulling towards myself and then if I want to uh, change the angle, I can tip the spoon like that to change the angle. Now, here I have a situation where the shoulders flare out a little wider than I have been able to achieve like this. Thankfully, my spoon knife curves up enough that I can come in like this. You see how that spoon knife curves up enough that I can come in like this? And again, thumb braced on the opposite side of where, I'm, where I am here. Because it's all about coming in towards my thumb. And I can widen that shoulder up to be exactly what I want. On this side, I hold it like this and thumb braced on the opposite side. I come in like this. Now at a certain point here, I'm going to hit this spot where the grain changes. And that's the tricky spot. You either need to come back and get these two to meet this way. Or this is a situation where it might make sense to come in from the side. And see how the actual the curvature of the knife sort of matches the curvature of what I'm trying to achieve in terms of the rim here. So in that circumstance, I'm coming straight down in and then sweeping through my cut. So I'm using the curvature of the blade to essentially to establish what that line of the rim is going to look like, just like that. How am I doing so far, guys? Okay, so now... When I get to about this stage where I'm starting to define the rim, I think one of the important things that I do is I try and get right up to the rim. Similar to what I did right here, I'm going to go around and just get that rim nice and sweet first. And then I'm going to get the depth and the curvature inside to match up and be a clean sweep out to that line of the rim that I'm going to establish at this point. If I don't... Um, if I don't establish this rim the way I want it first, then, and just try and hit it exactly as I'm doing the curvature on the inside, the likelihood that I'm going to hit it is way lower. Whereas if I establish it now without having, so essentially separating it as, as a process from whatever needs to happen to the inside, then I can get it exactly how I want it, fairly simply, right? And now I can do the inside of the bowl and get that curvature just so. Good. Um, so let's talk about rim thickness for a second here. As a general rule, when you're starting out, giving yourself a thicker rim is helpful because it means that you can make a mistake and you'll have some material to make adjustments with. Where, what I think is not super helpful is trying to make a thick rim that is even all the way around. And here's why. A rim that is even all the way around is a lot more difficult <coughs> than a rim that is different depending on where on the spoon you are. So my rims tend to be thicker here at the tip, thinner on the sides because that feels best in your mouth. <laughs> and then slightly thicker back here, but not as thick as up here. What that did, what that does, Sully, it's, uh, it's cherry. That's, if, if in doubt, I'm carving cherry. 
What that does is that it allows you to focus on does your rim have a nice line to it instead of is my rim exactly the same as everywhere else. And if you make a mistake, you don't then have to go and completely readjust every single part of the rim. So it isolates a mistake from having ripple effects that cascade throughout the entire spoon. When possible, I like to isolate different aspects of the spoon so that one problem doesn't cascade to the rest of the spoon and then you adjust and adjust and adjust and adjust and before you know it, the whole spoon is ruined. So you'll see my rims are slightly different sizes. Let's pull this spoon to that same point now. So let's see, I started doing my hollowing. Now I'm going to do the same thing with the rim, although my rim is going to be slightly thicker because this is a standard cooking spoon. Unlike this camping spoon that also needs to feel good in your mouth, standard cooking spoon, it's nice for it to have fairly strong rim at the beginning. So again, uh, let's see, any tips on the back of the bowl? You always struggle to get a sharp, clean cut where it meets the neck. Do you mean this spot here in the neck here or more like here? <clears throat> so, um, so again, the key for me is choking up on the blade. Now this obviously only works if you have a blade that has a nice rounded spine like this. Don't do this on that more blade that has the sharpness on both sides. Um, and then having my thumb always braced so that I'm pulling towards my thumb. That's the key. So, oh, and holding it like this, don't actually do that. That's, no, do I? Yeah, I guess I do, but I don't hold it back here. I always hold it like this. Because if you hold it here, it, it twists too much. So you got to hold it with your fingers in the, like this. <clears throat> On the other side in the bowl itself. Uh... <clears throat> oh, I see what you mean. You mean like right here. Okay, yeah, we'll get to that in this one. Um, this wood has been sitting in the log for a couple months. But other than that, it's, it's green. Um, so... Here, you can see I want to make this cut with the grain, which is flowing from the tip down towards the deepest part of the crank here. Um, and notice that I, these fingers here are keeping the whole thing braced. If I was to hold this here, I would have to really hold it tight to keep this thing from twisting because you're exerting a fair amount of pressure on the bowl here. So by having my fingers here, it allows me to, everything just is much more stable in the palm of my hand. So now, right here, this is the part of the spoon where being able to come in with the tip of your blade is key. And let me just take a moment and say that this is where the Monadnock excels. The Monadnock, let's have a little history, is based off of my first ever hook knife, which was a Robin Wood open sweep hook knife. Now, I bought this. This is one of the first hook knives that Robin made when he started out, and he was hammering these curves out by hand, uh, which meant that they were each slightly different. And I bought this. This is in a handle that Matt made after the fact. I bought this and loved it. And then when I was tooling up to start teaching, I ordered more of the same tool from Robin, and they came, and they were much more open. Um, and even worse, you see how that tip is tipped over the handle? The new ones were tipped so that the tip of the blade was in line with the handle, which meant that it didn't have the versatility of being able to essentially to do this cut where you're in the back of the shoulder and you need to be able to sort of clean up this shoulder here from this direction going with the grain right here. That cut is when why people think that you need a lefty and a righty hook knife. If your hook knife doesn't curve up enough for you to be able to do this, then uh, then you're not going to be then you're going to be frustrated because the only other way that you can go uh, can, that you can do this is to come across it like this and sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't depending on how deep you are so way before Matt ever decided to make hook knives I reached out to Robin and said um, it's probably a oh, probably nine months before, no, almost a full year before 
Matt started making hook knives. I reached out to Robin and said, I love this hook knife. Here's my feedback. You didn't ask for it, but uh, here's the original one. Here's the other ones. <clears throat> you can see what's going on. Is there any chance that, you know, you might want to take this into consideration and make tools that work a little bit, you know, that, that have these features that you have lost with your new ones? Um, and he said, uh, actually, we just changed the tool that we use. Now we use a fly press, I think it was. Um, so that curve, the one that I didn't like, is it is what it is now. It's just, it is what it is. So when Matt started wanting to make hook knives, I said, let's, why don't you make it this exact curve? This is, this is such a great curve. And so that's why this has that same curve and that same slight tip over the handle. It's because I learned these things from my Robin wood knife, but it wasn't something that Robin himself decided to keep doing as, as like an articulated design point. It's just something that happened by chance. <clears throat> so if your hook, if your hook knife can't do this thing that I'm doing here, it might be a function of its geometry is my point. Um, um, did I use a palm peeler grip to go with the grain. Yeah. So as long as you have your thumb braced here, and the whole thing sort of held tightly in the palm of your hand, you can go with the grain in this particular situation here. Um, now, to the point of getting a nice clean line across the back here, sometimes it makes sense to, again, use the curvature of the hook knife to dive straight in at the neck there and get a nice clean line this way. That's how I used to do it. It doesn't work particularly great. In fact, because you're diving straight in and then trying to exit out, it just doesn't work great. So more recently, I found myself coming across this way and getting a nice clean line this way. <clears throat> now, if you're having a hard time getting a nice clean line this way because it's lopsided and never looks completely symmetrical. That's because you need to, there are lots of adjustments you need to make as you dive through here to make sure that you end up with a clean symmetrical look. Um, but you can see that it's possible to get a nice clean line to the back of the bowl there, straight from going across it like that. And then you can adjust from either side as you wish, or even come in again from this way. But you want to be careful not to run too much to the rim and, and completely eliminate the rim. Hi, Justin. Um, okay, so now I'm going to continue going So you see how here it dug in and started to tear. So as soon as I felt it do that, I stopped. Um, notice you don't do loads of sternum reinforced cuts for the bowl. Sternum braced cuts on the bowl. How would you do a sternum braced? I don't even know what you mean by a sternum braced cut on the bowl. I'm gonna have to go look at what Tom does. A sternum braced... Oh, you mean like where you're doing this on the bowl. Um, <coughs> you're right. I don't do a ton. I do. I probably will do more once I get into doing more of the hollowing the bowl because there is a lot of going in this direction. But right now when I'm going around and establishing the inner rim, it's more about turning the spoon around and around in your hand so that the knife is going in the right direction for the grain orientation. Um, so again, same with the previous spoon, 